Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the program. I'm Stephen Stone, Trent University Chancellor and proud alumnus. Last week on Trent Talks, our experts discussed at-home dynamics and how we can continue to get along while being held in close quarters. Today, we're joined by two very accomplished faculty of Trent University, Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe and Dr. Brenda Smith Chan, who will help us with strategies for managing our mental health and personal resilience. And just as, before we begin, Robin, I understand that you are part of Autonomy College. Yes, and I Brenda, am. you belong to Julian Blackburn College and also studied at the Durham campus as a student. And me, um, I was a member of Champlain College, but way, way back in the uh, in the mid 1960s when Trent was first starting. So anyway, thank you both so much for joining us. And by way of a brief introduction, Brenda, you focus your research on cognitive development. Uh, including how social programs influence cognition and behavior, as well as community-based initiatives to help face the challenges of change. And Robin, you are a multi-award winning psychology and education instructor, and you specialize in resiliency and navigating stress and change, as well as leadership and personal wellness in the workplace. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this today. Uh, before we begin our discussion though, uh, let us first respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisagig Anishinaabe. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. Now, before we address today's questions from the audience, um, Robin, in last week's episode, we talked a little bit about how we're all moving through the same storm but in different boats. So to carry on the analogy, how can we continue to weather the storm in ways that are helpful for our mental health? Excellent question. And thank you for the opportunity to be here today to share some of this information. So sometimes what I think about when we think about resiliency and knowing this kind of notion that we're in the season of a storm, what I think is helpful to position our mindset that sometimes these storms come, but not to disrupt our lives, but perhaps to clear a path. And this opportunity that we're being presented with is perhaps this opportunity where we can hit pause, we can take this time to reflect, we can think about our priorities, our purpose and our pace, and use this opportunity to practice everyday resiliency so we can find that clear path forward and get to the other side of COVID-19, where we're in a place of being stronger and healthier and more mindful of what this experience means to ourselves, to our institutions as community members and as Canadians. Cool. And, and Brenda, turning to you, the time length of this new normal, although I'm starting to say, can we promise that after this episode, we no longer have to refer to the phrase new normal? But anyway, for now, the time length of this new normal for individuals is unknown. So how can we possibly take care of ourselves when there's so much uncertainty about the immediate future? One of the things I think is so important uh, and uh, that we need to remind people uh, as they move forward is uh, two things. Um, first of all, uh, self-compassion and compassion for others to understand that that what we're going through is exceptional. And when we are behaving or we see others who are close to us behaving in ways that seem to be uh, problematic or challenging, that this is stress behavior, uh, not misbehavior, not, um, not a reflection of the character. And uh, that what we need to do is go into this uh, process, understanding that we're going to be troubleshooting and going with the times. And that's not a flaw, that's actually a strength. And so uh, this is an opportunity to look at some of the stressors in our environment and how we can move forward, acknowledging that there are stressors, but at the same time uh, being effective in, in negative circumstances. Okay, uh, well, that's an excellent start to uh, providing context to the questions that are upcoming. And let's start right in. Uh, and maybe Robin going to you first. Um, when you talk about resilience, what do you mean? And, and if I can rephrase that, during these uncertain times, how can we find and build resilience within ourselves? 
Yeah. So how I have chosen to define resiliency, and there's many different definitions out there, is our capacity to be able to navigate the setbacks, navigate the unpredictability or the uncertain times. And resiliency doesn't mean we have the skill set that makes us bulletproof. It means that we are aware of how our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors will impact our capacity to problem solve, to think about what's our next right move that we can make right now. The work that I've done and my team has done has uncovered that there's essentially five core competencies that actually contribute to someone's baseline for resiliency. And I'd take a moment just to share those with you because I think this gives people context as to anywhere along that theory, you can jump in here to think about what are some strategies and tools that I could use here. So the first and foremost that we've come upon working with people all over the world, and again, everything from first responders to persons in remote communities, all the way to our military, are these ideas that it's important that we have a sense of belonging. We need to know where we belong, where we have voice, where we have that sense of a home team. And that home team is what's going to give us strength. It's going to give us confidence and our capacity to be vulnerable, to be nervous, but trust that it's going to be okay on the other side of it. The second part my program talks about is the importance of perspective. And perspective means it's this capacity to hold a mindset that also takes into consideration how we feel. So it's an alignment between our head and our heart. And sometimes the greatest delta can actually be between our head and our heart and is actually getting ourselves on the same page. So right now, a perspective example of COVID-19 could be this idea that we're working from home. But the reality of perspective shift would be that we're at home trying to be part of the solution during a global pandemic, trying to get work done. And when we have that wee bit of a shift of a perspective, all of a sudden it keeps everything in context. The third that we've uncovered in my work is the the role of acceptance. And what we mean by this is persons that have a baseline for resiliency know when they can lean into what's within my control and ultimately what's in our control are our thoughts and our behaviors and what's outside of our control, which is essentially everything else. But what we think about is when you come up to a difficult situation, can I persist through it? If I can't persist, can I pivot? Can I switch or adapt? And the third option, if you can't make it through it, we punt it away. We acknowledge that that's not within my control. I'm going to move on. Now, the fourth variable that we talk about in my work is being hope-filled or hopefulness. And I have a really quick story to share with you where we came upon this work that I think people can relate to. And I had an opportunity to work with a group of soldiers when they were coming home after a tour of duty. And I was really curious about what do you hope for or look forward to the next day when you just came home after a tour? So I was talking to these group of soldiers and the first one said to me, tomorrow on his very first day off, he was going to paint the rest of his kitchen. And I thought, wow, all this time and you're going to paint your kitchen. And the next soldier said that he was going to lay down hardwood floor because before he left, he only got half done. I spoke to this entire platoon and they all had house projects, which I thought was so peculiar. So I asked their lieutenant, I said, sir, why did all these soldiers leave half finished house projects before deployment? And what he shared with me was something that was so transformational to my work. He said, Robin, those soldiers leave those as signs of hope for their families that they're coming home. So every time they come in, they see that half finished project, they can lean into the belief they're coming home. And the next part was so significant because he said, Doc, hope is a choice. We have to choose to be hope filled in every situation to be able to be of service to others. So I think about what persons are going through right now, our frontline responders, everything from our cashiers to our medical professionals, and they're doing their job hope-filled. The fifth one and the last one is the role of humor or finding those pockets of joy or where we can feel lightheartedness. Because if we're only thinking about the big and heavy, we feel overwhelmed. So this is where we lean into those little pockets where we can actually have this experience of joy. And right now I want to give such a shout out to our artists. Think about how much the artists have contribute to COVID-19 solutions. They're giving us things to watch. They're giving us things to enjoy. Um, All of us are contributing in our own way. So when I think about resiliency, those are five areas that we can start to have conversations about. Uh, thank you so much for those five um, responses. And I love the story about the soldiers. It almost makes me, uh, my eyes go moist. That, that That's really quite uplifting. 
Um, Brenda, um, within the, the, the structure of the five, um, we all have certain behaviors and habits and routines. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. But how can, are there any tricks to successfully change the habits and, and routines that aren't so good? Well, with my research group at the Self-Regulation Institute um, and the Merit Center, one of the things we do is uh, we have a five-step process that we, we ask people to sort of think about when they're encountering challenges uh, that are causing them a lot of tension. And the first is that when you see a behavior that you're having trouble uh, with or, or a situation where you're experiencing difficulties is to reframe the behavior as a stress behavior because that, even the wording that you use, Stephen, um, that, you know, we have bad habits. Uh, mm -hmm. These bad habits are, are stress habits mm -hmm. and it's a reflection that we need to deal with tension and it's a reflection of the tension that we're encountering. Once you identify that you have uh, a stress reaction, I want, we ask people to be a little bit of a detective uh, to recognize the stressors. And stressors in an environment in cap, can be uh, across multiple domains, including biological stressors like uh, being too hot, too cold, feeling ill. Uh, it can be uh, emotional, um, grieving the loss of others, uh, feeling terrified about the news if you're watching a lot of media. Um, it can be cognitive, thinking through worries. Uh, it can also uh, be uh, social, uh, being in close contact with others who are going through a lot of stressors themselves, but also pro-social, the, the impact of others who are, who are around us, even if they're not physically present, uh, who are, are there. So we always ask people to think about what what stressors may be impacting them, and then where possible, reduce stressors, eliminate them, but reduce where you can, and then reflect uh, to to sort of look at, consider it like a detective, a stress detective is often the terminology we use, to think about, well, what's working, what's not working. And then the final is uh, to teach, uh, to to respond and uh, get ahead of the game. And that process is iterative uh, because what works on Tuesday won't work on Wednesday and what works on Wednesday won't work on Thursday. So it's a constant process and people shouldn't feel that that's negative, they should recognize that that is the human condition. This is part of how we navigate our world naturally. That's right. You've both given five steps, and um, I'm, I'm. I hope I should have been writing them down, but I'll, I'll go back and rewatch re the program and write down each of the five steps because because that's that's really good. Um, Robin, turning uh, again to you, as we know here in Ontario, but elsewhere in the world also, some of the restrictions uh, we've all been living with are slowly starting to lift, but some people don't appear to be playing by the rules. Um, or to put it more nicely, maybe they are simply over eager for a return to our normal uh, pre-COVID routines. But it can be frustrating okay. to see people behaving in a way that's not following physical distancing protocols. So here's the question. How can we better manage our negative feelings about the behaviors of others? Mm -hmm. Such a good question. Um, so I came upon a quote when I started doing this. I can't believe we've been in isolation for nine weeks, but David Hollisbeck wrote, in the rush to return to normal, can we use this time to reflect on which parts deserve that urgency to rush back to? Like what parts are actually worth rushing back to? And I think what happens sometimes is we have this big urgency to get back to this notion of normal. However, I do think that unfortunately, what are behavior and a lot of our behaviors prior to COVID-19, a lot of those behaviors weren't actually that normal. When we see the prevalence of mental health, when we see the prevalence of adolescents that are at risk, when we see the, the strain on family systems and communities. So I think what's, um, I, I appreciate that there's this urgency to get back and the folks who, who are trying to get back really quickly, um, I think maybe haven't used this time to pause. Like the world slowed down, but did we slow down? Did we use that time constructively? Now, unfortunately, despite all we know about behaviorism, and I'm sure Brenda would echo this, 
we can't change anyone else's behavior. Although we would love to, we can't change that stranger's behavior in the store. But what we can always do is model the behavior that we want to establish and practice for ourselves. When COVID-19 happened so quickly in our province, I remember sitting down and saying, okay, how am I going to deal with this, right? I'm, I look after my family. I look after people. I have three young ones. And I made the decision in that moment, Stephen, that my intention for COVID-19 was I wanted to be a good role model for my children on what it looks like to navigate a global pandemic. And so that involves following the rules. That involves listening to our health professionals. It involves respecting the boundaries and the practices of people who are putting a lot of good thinking behind how to set us up for success. So unfortunately, I think what the first step is, is that all we can really do is model the behavior that we want to. So for example, when we see somebody who's not practicing physical distance, make a point of really practicing physical distancing. And I've done that on the paths. I've done that walking down the sidewalk with my dogs. Um, another thing we can do when we start to feel that stress building up, we can remind ourselves that the peace that we're seeking is always inside of ourselves. There's always that place we can go to with our breath to bring us into the present moment and keep our emotions in check. And if we can do a wee bit of breath work, even standing in the line at the grocery store waiting to get in, if we can just use that opportunity to make sure we're getting deep breaths, when our body does those deep inhalations, it sends the cue to our brain that we're safe. And when we start to feel frustrated and we have those short, rapid breaths, it sends the cues to our brain that we're in danger, which exacerbates that negative feeling and that frustration. Staying calm, knowing that we have breath work, it is always available. We never forget our breath at home, which is so convenient. So we always have it with us and we can lean into that to keep our emotions in a place that are going to come from a good place. That has so much resonance for me. Uh, some people may know I'm, I'm a meditator. I've meditated for 40 or 50 years. And so focusing on the breath comes very naturally. My wife um, used to say to me, well, I don't, I don't really get meditation. And I said, yeah, but you swim every morning, uh, at least in the summertime. And what are you doing when you swim? I think you're focusing on your breath. So I think actually in many ways you are meditating because mm -hmm. if you don't focus on your breath when you're swimming, you're in, you're in trouble. There's, um, there's uh, some interesting research, if I could just add. Uh, for people who find it very hard to do the breath work in formal meditation, and it actually, in some individuals, could trigger um, just a over-focus on their breathing. They get a little uptight about, you know, doing it mm -hmm. right or, or the, uh, the way it feels. It's particularly true if you have asthma or other breathing conditions. One of the, your point, Stephen, is bang on. Uh, breath work can, can occur in uh, singing. So mm -hmm. sometimes that's why people find singing very relaxing or prayer. Uh, if if you have um, if you have a faith uh, or other forms where breath work is inherently part of the process can help if uh, doing the deep breathe, breathing triggers a stress response in you. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, Brenda, um, <clears throat> let's move on to the next question. Uh, many people have been laid off. Uh, and those who are still working may be worried that their employment status could change, and there's no clear understanding of how long uh, the impact of this pandemic could last. Uh, this uncertainty is leading to a lot of anxiety and fear. It's over the full range of society, whether it's single income families or new grads looking for their first job, really for everyone. So what can we, can we do to not let this fear really paralyze us as we move through the various phases of the pandemic? There's uh, multiple things that people can do. One is to acknowledge and to, re to recognize this is a stressor. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. This is touching on the very heart of people's well-being and uh, how, they, how they feel secure in our environment. And uh, so to acknowledge the stress and to to realize that there's no way uh, that this wouldn't be difficult for, for people. I think the, uh, the way that I would advise uh, people according to the research is as much as possible, take each issue and look for strategy. So work on 
a cognitive plan, but write down your cognitive, like write down a plan, keep track, uh, lists, um, move the the uh, rumination, the thinking from inside the head onto a page. And often that action of just getting it written down where it's in a physical uh, in a physical uh, form can help alleviate that. I don't need to think about it anymore. It's on the page. The other thing is to un recognizing that this is a stressor is to be kind to yourself in other domains while you're thinking through strategies and looking at options um, to make sure that you're nurturing your emotional well-being, your physical well-being. Uh, and this is probably the most important thing from a human perspective. And Robin touched on this earlier, the social connection. You need people who are calming to you, who are inspiring to you, who who make you feel safe. And that might be family, it might be a friend, but this is not a time to think of being uh, solo. The negative, the negative aspect of the term self-regulation implies that it's all within, and it is, but one of the things that we know is that having others help us regulate to calm us down allows us to access that inner self, uh, that inner calm. And so to make sure that you have those connections uh, with people, even if they're not in person, that you have social media, it's a good time to make uh, you know connections outside your group, find people who, who help you. And this is the, the final thing. Keep in mind that this is unprecedented. This is global. So you are not alone in this. That whatever you're going through financially and in your career, this is something that's being experienced by hundreds of thousands of individuals. There will be solutions that need to be addressed as we progress forward in this. And we have to have some faith that, you know, something that impacts this many people, uh, there will be workarounds. So to keep a really positive, hopeful thought that there will be other things that we can do. Cool. Um, our final audience question, uh, turning to you, Robin. Um, each day brings its own challenges and deviations from um, of what are the routines we're used to. How can we be adaptable when a day may not go as we had initially planned? Yeah, that's a great question. What to, to answer that, I'm going to take one little step back. And I think what's really important, especially when we're in this really significant season of unpredictability, is the importance of actually having a day map and having a plan of what we're trying to accomplish. And routines are extremely important. But one of the things that I encourage folks to get is to not think too much about the rigidness of the routine as opposed to just some general practices. And the one practice that my research team and I've identified right now that's having probably the most significant impact is a practice that we call bookending your day. And what that means is that you start the first hour of your day and protect that hour and you protect the last hour of your day. So when you start your day, you have a routine that, that or a ritual that kind of sets the tone. That's when we can practice the meditation. That's when we can walk. That's when we can kind of get a sense of what we want to accomplish. We know the best ways to not win your morning is to check your email, right? As soon as you wake up, jumping on email. I like to think of my email box as a place that holds everyone else's agenda. Um, it doesn't hold Robin's agenda. It holds all of the things that they want me to do today. So if we can protect the first hour and the last hour, we actually can start the day and end in a day where we feel restored, we feel a sense of accomplishment. And when then those little hiccups and disruptions and kind of parts of our day go off the rails, we're not as likely to get so impacted by them because we already have a sense of accomplishment and we are doing a practice of what we call like protecting your peace. 
So one of those kind of questions we prompt folks to think about is when you're being triggered by all of those other events that's happening, we kind of ask ourselves, what's the, the cost of this to protect your peace? And we know that that sense of calm comes within us. That's something that we hold inside of ourselves intrinsically. So again, asking ourselves, is that worth it? Is that worth that event? That is it worth getting upset? Is it worth losing your sense of peace for? But we see persons are more able to do that and keep things in perspective when they book end their day. They start on the right foot and then they can prepare their body for sleep and they protect that last hour of their day. So again, simple things like that help to minimize some of those interruptions in the main part of the day. Guilty as charged. <laughs> I, I compulsively, 30 seconds after I'm awake, I look at my email. So I promise you, I'm going I'm to do it differently. I'm going to wait at least an hour. Okay. There you go. Or even five minutes, right? Little micro <laughs> behavioral changes, those work. But again, just, you know, and one of the interesting practices, and I love the idea about when you first wake up in the morning, whatever you say first is the tone that you want to use to set your day. So as soon as you wake up in the morning, can we start by saying thank you? Right, just thanking the fact that we get today and today's a whole big bright day with no mistakes in it yet. Right, that's how Anne Shirley used to say it as a fellow redhead. But the notion is we start the day with intention of gratitude, and that sets the tone. If we wake up with a, a to do list, that doesn't really, it puts us in the state of reactivity all day versus proactively choosing to do your day. And one of the other little micro behaviors we talk about is, you know, we all have our to do list, but can we also have our to be list? How do you want to be today? And right now, my to-be list is actually more important to me than my to-do list. Because with three kiddos at home and trying to navigate, a, my husband's also at home remotely working, I need to be patient. I don't need to necessarily get all those tick boxes on my to-do list. I need to make sure that I'm patient and I'm receptive and I'm kind. So again, just some simple ways to kind of keep it in perspective. Cool. Well, my, my final question, and this is for each of you, but actually you've both been so positive and hopeful um, that uh, you've almost already answered this question, but I'll, I'll ask it again. And maybe Brenda, you first, what are the positive takeaways and lessons we can take forward from these difficult times? The most important lesson, um, and I think Robin touched on this, and I just want to reiterate self-compassion, to be kind to oneself, to take a look at the, the activities that make you feel positive and make you feel uh, centered, and to understand those are not indulgent. Those are not behaviors that you should uh, avoid. Those are behaviors that are really important cues as to what you need in order to get to that place of calm and find your peace. And understand that what brings one person peace doesn't necessarily work for everyone else. Um, I know, uh, uh, you know, my significant other in the past, he would say, you know, what works for you? And uh, it would be, okay, well, what works for me is, uh, is, you know, to have a shoulder massage. Whereas for him, that was a, something that just didn't work for him. He, he would actually uh, find it very, very stressful to have his shoulders touched. He needed peace and quiet. So to understand, and peace and quiet for me is the worst thing you could do. <laughs> I, I'm a person who loves people and I need to have that connection. So understanding that um, self-compassion is the way forward, but also what works for one person may not be the thing that calms another person. And to find those, uh, to be open to exploring what works for you, but also to understanding that your needs change from a, a, over the course of the day, but also from day to day. So uh, that hour that Robin was talking about in the morning often is a really good time to check in with yourself and to say, where do I need to go? What kinds of things do uh, I want to do today? And uh, the final thing I would say is, Please, if I could give people one gift, this is not a situation where we're alleviated from the demands of our environment and we should consider it a time to be uber productive. This is an emergency situation and what we need to do is be protective of ourselves and the people around us, that we need more care. We need more support than we would if this is not a vacation for anyone. And to recognize that this idea that we can be productive, work at home and look after kids 
and deal with all of the limitations that are impacting everybody as well as the challenges, it's just not tenable. And we need to be kind to ourselves as well as to the people around us. Well, thank you for that. And Robin, is there a final hopeful message you can leave us with yeah, today? Yeah, for sure. My favorite message of hope is this idea and ways to maintain hope is the notion that we can always choose our focus. And I like to refer to this as the practice of lighthousing. So choosing what is having light, because whatever we're focusing on and looking upon is what's going to give us the energy or the kind of guide our behavior. And where this actually comes upon is when my family immigrated to Canada from Scotland. Um, I remember thinking about, you know, my family went across on a transatlantic voyage and there were so many storms when my grandfather was coming here with a very young family and he was feeling really scared and really overwhelmed until he saw the lighthouse in Prince Edward Island. And when he came upon that idea that he saw the lighthouse, it's the idea that he felt safe. And, that, and that's one of the things that I think about, that if we only look at the storms, we're going to feel very anxious and we're going to have a hard time maintaining our morale and protecting that morale and that positivity. But if we look for the lighthouse, look at what's giving us focus and work towards that, it's going to guide our behavior in a way that we can feel safe and we can know that we're doing the best we can with the tools we have. So I think it's really important wherever we put our energy, we're going to, that's what's going to flow after it. So to be mindful, and maybe that means we are not going to consume all of the media that is only talking about the negativity. It's choosing to find the good news stories and then sharing those good news stories. And, you know, I know my favorite good news story I've come upon was when the Chicago Aquarium showed footage of these little baby penguins who were starting to get very, very isolated because the exhibits were closed. And then all of a sudden they let the baby penguins go explore the pavilions. And you see these baby penguins looking at the fish tanks and meeting a baby beluga whale. And again, it's just these little good news stories where we can see creativity and innovation. It can come if we choose to keep our stress at bay. So then that way the other stuff can kind of surface and give us something to focus upon. Lighthousing. I love it. That's great. Thank you so much, both of you, Robin and Brenda, for your insights today. Uh, that was great. And for those of you at home, thank you as well for your time. I hope you'll tune in again next week as we welcome Trent University Dean of Social Sciences and Humanities, Dr. Mark Skinner, and English and Gender and Women's Studies Professor, Dr. Sally Chivers, to discuss aging together and apart, uh, and to answer your questions about aging, care, and community in complicated times. In the meantime, we do want to hear your thoughts about today's program, and also to encourage you to submit questions for next week. And you can do so by continuing the discussion on social using the Trent Talks hashtag. Until next week, take care of yourselves, and please always remember, you are not alone. Goodbye for now.